So if I say Mad King, what's the first thing that comes to your mind? Maybe a show called Game of Thrones, maybe a leader called Kim Jong-un, maybe a crazy person, so to speak. But craziness is one of the last things that you really want in a king. You need a king who is intelligent, who is wise. Well, King Nebuchadnezzar, who was king over Babylon in the 6th century, actually went crazy. And for seven years, uh, the Old Testament, the book of Daniel records, for seven years, he let his hair grow long and he had really long fingernails and he uh, ate grass for, for, for seven years straight. And so here you have this king over one of the greatest empires that the world has ever seen turns crazy. I'd like to share with you a little bit about Nebuchadnezzar this morning, and I'd like to tell you that, as I said, King Nebuchadnezzar oversaw one of the greatest kingdoms that the world has ever seen. He is recorded in Greek and Roman history. He is actually recorded uh, in modern-day academic studies, one of the most important people that historians will discover. It is one of the largest archaeological sites known to man, and King Nebuchadnezzar really was quite an incredible person. And I've had the opportunity to read some scholarship, look at some history, see some of the things that they actually have discovered in modern-day Babylon, so to speak, that actually is in modern-day Iraq. And if I could have you walk away with three things about Nebuchadnezzar, it would be that Nebuchadnezzar, believe it or not, was an incredible architect. He was an incredible builder of wonder. He was also an incredible annihilator of his enemies, a fierce army commander. And he was also not only those things, but he was an incredible administrator. In order to oversee and control that much territory and that much land, you've got to be somebody special. Well, as I said, as an architect, he actually is pictured in the book of Daniel, not only as somebody who dreams about statues, but also somebody who builds statues. Uh, He was a great builder. He's actually attributed with building the Hanging Gardens of Babylon, and that's one of the ancient seven wonders of the world. And it's, it's this really incredible, really artwork. It's this piece of art where trees and shrubs would overhang this incredible structure that would be built up high into the sky. Donald Wiseman wrote in 1983 his book titled Nebuchadnezzar in Babylon, and he's actually quoting Nebuchadnezzar here, who they have found writings in history. Nebuchadnezzar says that I formed baked bricks into the likeness of a mountain and built a large steppe terrace. It was a structure as a royal abode for myself way high up. He not only built the hanging gardens, but he also built a summer palace for himself. It was this incredibly enormous city. It was, it was marked out in a, in a square, and it had this great big tower referenced as Bibble that many of us know as the Tower of Babel in history. It had double reinforced walls, so it had an outer wall and an inner wall, and it was a city large enough to hold 200,000 people. We're talking about an incredible city. That was architected and built by this man named Nebuchadnezzar. Well, he also built temples. And he fashioned them. They were some of the most beautiful temples that you would ever see. In fact, in the Babylonian Chronicle, he talks about building these temples. And and here's what he writes. Stephen Langdon actually translated the words of Nebuchadnezzar in 1912 in his book called The Neo-Babylonian Royal Inscriptions. And he says, I plated the furnishings of the temple with red gold and the processional boat with yellow gold with precious stones so that it was studded like the heavens with the stars. And so he was an incredible architect. But as I said earlier, he was not only an incredible architect, he was an incredible annihilator of his enemies. He was a feared army commander. The book of Daniel actually pictures Nebuchadnezzar in Babylon like a lion with wings. A lion is somebody that's like the king of the jungle, but he also sees Nebuchadnezzar as having the wings of an eagle, which means he is fierce and he is fast. Uh, And Daniel writes about this in Daniel chapter 3 and in Daniel chapter 6. When you look into history, Ronald Sack writes in 2004 in his book called The Images of Nebuchadnezzar, he writes that Nebuchadnezzar was so feared even before he became a king that he had already established himself with a considerable reputation as a field commander. And in fact, in 605 BC, he had actually taken the initiative to the Egyptians at the Battle of Carchemish, and he beat them, not even king yet, and he is already respected and feared among the nations. 
In 626 BC, we actually have this prophecy by Jeremiah. And he actually writes uh, in, in the book of Jeremiah, chapter 50, verse 2, he talks about Nebuchadnezzar coming against Israel and how God is going to predict this king, the king of Babylon, coming to Judah, so to speak, and destroying them. And here's what it says. This is what the Lord says. I will summon all the peoples of the north, And my servant Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon, declares the Lord, I will bring them against this land and its inhabitants and against all the surrounding nations, and I will completely destroy them and make them an object of horror and scorn and an everlasting ruin. Jeremiah says, look, King Nebuchadnezzar is going to come against Judah, and he is going to destroy them. That's the powerful imagery of this type of king that we're talking about. And in fact, this ancient historian, Barosius, he actually wrote about this destruction that you can read about in the book of Daniel as well. And he says that King Nebuchadnezzar came against Judah and he destroyed it. And he went into the temple and he took out the artifacts, but he left the Ark of the Covenant. And he transported them back to the land of Babylon and he put them in his temple. And so we are dealing with a man who is an incredible architect a feared annihilator of his enemies, but he is also one of the most incredible administrators that the world has ever seen. I mean, think about it. In order to control that much land and conquer that many empires, you cannot do it on your own. And so when we look into history, and I actually was reading Dr. Uh, Mark Magano, and he wrote in his commentary on the book of Daniel, that what Nebuchadnezzar would do is he would go to a nation or a city and he would destroy it. And then he would take those captives back to Babylon and he would train them and assimilate them into Babylonian culture. And then he would transplant those future uh, diplomats back into their country in order to prevent them from rebelling against him as the king. And so he had this incredibly masterful plan in order to control the world, to become the greatest empire that this world has ever seen. Again, the historian Barosius documents this, and he talks about King Nebuchadnezzar coming in and controlling and and dominating these types of uh, nations. And then he also established what's called the Code of Hammurabi. And a lot of people don't know about this, but if you actually look in ancient culture, they've actually discovered these clay tablets that they actually had a rule of law. Just like the Israelites had in their land, so they have these inscriptions and these laws that they were to live by. And of course, it is far removed from our moral compass that we know and experience today. But nevertheless, he was able to control and establish this rule of law through the land that gave him the ability to administrate and oversee. And so if you, can, if you can picture Nebuchadnezzar as this incredible military commander, administrator, and king, and if you look at the map up on the screen for you, you will see just the vast amount of territory that he oversaw. From Egypt all the way to India, up to ancient Assyria, down to modern-day Saudi Arabia or the Arabian Desert. He was an incredible administrator, an incredible annihilator, an incredible architect. And if we will venture and look back into history, there are some incredible lessons that we can learn and apply to us. And that's where we find ourselves in the book of Daniel. In Daniel chapter 1, if you'll turn there with me, in Daniel chapter 1, verses 1 and 2, we've got King Nebuchadnezzar coming against Judah. And it says in verse 1, in the third year of the reign of Jehoiakim, king of Judah, Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, came to Jerusalem and besieged it. And look at this. And the Lord delivered Jehoiakim, king of Judah, into his hand, along with some of the articles from the temple of God. These he carried off into the temple of his God in Babylonia and put in the treasure house of his God. And so it's very important to understand from this text that it was the Lord who delivered the king of Judah, Jehoiakim, into Nebuchadnezzar's hand. It was God's plan all along because Judah had gone rogue. Judah had turned their backs against God, they had worshipped idols, they had divulged in sin, they had built structures of idol worship, and so they were in a really bad position, and they refused to get out of it. And the only way to bring them back into holiness was for God to send a man named King Nebuchadnezzar that we can read about in history against his own people. You see, God is at war. He is at war not only with false gods, but he is at war with his own people who are not true worshipers in the faith. 
And I think that's something that's really important for us to understand. That, first of all, God is certainly in control. Some people may think Donald Trump's in control. Some people may think Vladimir Putin's in control. Some people may think uh, a crazy person in North Korea is in control. But God has always been in control of the history of the world. And he uses kings and people and times and places in order to accomplish his will. And so as previously noted, here is King Nebuchadnezzar coming against Jerusalem. He ends up destroying it, and he enters the temple, he beats it down, he destroys it, and he takes all of the treasure, almost all of it, and he brings it back into what he calls his temple, the God of Marduk, or the God of Bel. And we're not just talking about loot here. In ancient times, when your nation or your city destroyed another person's city, it was a image. It was a victory. It was a symbol that my God is better than your God. Now think about that for a moment. God allowed this type of message to be correlated in history. The temporarily, the temporary victory of one God over another. But God had a reason. He had a purpose for allowing this. And we see this actually prophesied, as I said, in Jeremiah chapter 50, verse 2, where Jeremiah says, announce it and proclaim it among the nations. You've got this God uh, being Marduk, and you've got this King Nebuchadnezzar who's going to come against my people, but he will have his day. Even though he has this temporary victory, Babylon has got it coming to him. They're going to be judged just like the other nations. And look at what Jeremiah says. It says he will lift up a banner and proclaim it. Keep nothing back but say, Babylon will be captured. Bel will be put to shame. Marduk will be filled with terror. Her images will be put to shame and her idols will be filled with terror. And so Babylon was going to have its day, but it was not today. For Daniel, Babylon was going to win. For Daniel, Babylon was going to capture him and bring him back hundreds of miles from what he called his home in chains ready to be overrun and overtaken by this nation. And so if you look at Daniel chapter 1, verse 3, we see these hostages taken. It says in verse 3, Then the king ordered Aspenaz, chief of his court officials, to bring into the king's service some of the Israelites from the royal family and the nobility, young men without any physical defect. It's kind of like looking in the mirror here. Handsome, (laughs) showing aptitude for every kind of learning. Well-informed, quick to understand, and qualified to serve in the king's palace. We're talking about the best of the best. He was to teach them the language and the literature of the Babylonians. The king assigned them a daily amount of food and wine from the king's table, and they were, were to be trained for three years. And after that, they were to enter the king's service. And among those who were chosen were some from Judah, Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, Azariah, that's their Hebrew's name. But look at what happens in verse 7. The chief official gave them new names. To Daniel, the name Belshazzar. To Hananiah, Shadrach. To Mishael, Meshach. And to Azariah, Abednego. And this is the popular story that many of us know. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. But it's important to understand that Daniel and his friends were not only the most elite in the world, but they had to go through three years of training in order to become qualified to serve under the king. In other words, they were called to eat the food of Babylon, take Babylonian names, become Babylon. We are in a full-fledged culture, spiritual, religious war against Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. I mean, we are talking about not only just changing what they act like and think like, but literally changing who they are. I mean, think about this for a second, parents. Imagine sending your son or your daughter to a government school, and they want to indoctrinate your children. And so every single day, you've given them a name. You're a worshiper of Jesus. You're a worshiper of Jesus. You're a Christian. But every single day that they go to school, they are called by a false god. You're a Hindu. You're a Muslim. You're a Buddhist. You're an atheist. And that's probably one of the most prominent ones. You don't believe in God. Let's let's study academia over here. Let's do science. Let's study philosophy and history. You don't need God to do that. Don't bring your Bibles. Don't bring your religious jargon. Just leave all of that religious stuff out of the picture. And every single day of their life, they are hearing a message. You don't follow God. The one you used to serve isn't the one. Can you imagine the mental 
uh, war that was going on in their minds at this point. I mean, we are talking about an incredible culture war being waged against them. And so that's why I looked at Daniel. This is what we live in. I mean, your kids are confronting some of the most ridiculous garbage that they will ever have to confront in their entire lives when they go to school, when they're on social media, when they talk with some of their uh, friends on their sports teams. We're talking about a doctrinal, philosophical, spiritual war that is waged in our time, just like it was in ancient Babylon. And so Daniel's name, who meant God is my judge, has now been changed. Bell is your protector. Yahweh isn't your God. El isn't your God. It is now Bel. Hananiah, whose name meant the Lord is gracious, now follows under uh, Shadrach, the command of Aku. The moon god is who controls you now. Mishael, who is like our God? That's what his name means. Who is like our God has now been changed to Meshach, who is like Aku. And then Azariah, the Lord is my helper, the Lord has helped me, as now Abednego, I am a servant of Nebu. And so Nebuchadnezzar is going to invest this time, money, might, culture war, to wage war against their minds so that he can make them Babylonians. But there's a problem. You've got this giant in the faith, this faithful man who refuses to bow the knee to social pressure, and his name is Daniel. And I like Daniel. Daniel's a good-looking guy just like me, and so he's standing up to Nebuchadnezzar, and look at, look at what the story says. It says in Daniel chapter 1, verse 8, But Daniel resolved not to defile himself with royal food and wine. He took a stand, and he asked the chief official for permission not to defile himself. So he's not some ignorant fool who's just beating the war drum. He's, he has tact. We're dealing with a very wise individual, and so he asks permission first, right? Rather than creating conflict. Hey, do you, mind, do you mind if I not indulge in the sinful food and wine? And it says in verse 9, Now God had caused the official to show favor and compassion to Daniel. The same God that brought Nebuchadnezzar to Judah is the same God that's bringing compassion to Daniel. The message is God is in control. Verse 10. But the official told Daniel, I am afraid of my lord the king who has assigned your food and drink to me. Why should he see you looking worse than the young, other young men your age? The king would then have my head because of you. So he says, look Daniel, you might not want to eat this food, but I'd like to keep my head over you not wanting to eat this food. And look at Daniel's response. Then Daniel said to the guard, whom the chief official had appointed over Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah, please test your servant for ten days. Give us nothing but vegetables to eat and water to drink. Then compare our appearance with that of the young men who eat the royal food and treat your servants in accordance with what you see. Let's put God to the test. Let's try this out. I believe that if I honor God... If I do what is right, if I stand up for what I believe in, God is in control. He's going to bless me. Just wait and see. And then look at what happens. So he agreed, verse 14, to this and tested them for 10 days. And at the end of the 10 days, they looked healthier and better nourished. Some of your translations might have fatter, okay? That what that means is that they had more muscle on them than any of the other young men who ate the royal food. So the guard took away their choice food and the wine they were to drink and gave them vegetables instead. And man, I love this about Daniel. He is resolved. His feet are planted firm in the ground. He's not going to move an inch. He absolutely refuses to defile himself with food and wine. And this isn't just about the food, okay? This is about a spiritual, religious, intellectual issue, You see, the food and wine could have possibly been uh, prepared incorrectly according to the Levitical law. It had to be prepared a certain way. The food could have also have been food that they just frankly weren't allowed to eat. Uh, There were certain types of foods that they weren't allowed to eat. But Daniel was taking a stand because he knows to indulge in the culture, to indulge in this food and wine, is to take a step back from holiness. Think about this. What caused Israel or Judah to be in this situation in the first place? Was it not faithlessness? Was it not bending the knee? Was it not giving an inch to the culture? And next thing you know, you've got idol worship and sin and corruption and moral decay. And so Daniel is going to learn his lesson. Daniel says, yeah, I might not have died in Judah. I might not have died in in Israel. 
but if I die here, so be it, because I am not betraying God. I'm not walking back on my principles. I'm going to learn my lesson. I'm going to stand up for what's right, and I'm going to pursue after the Lord. And then we see this blessing in verse 9 that God caused the official to show favor and grace. God is in control. And so they could change Daniel's name, but they could not change his character. They could change what they called him. And every day he would wake up saying, Bell is your God. Bell is your God. Bell is your God. And every response, Daniel would say, the Lord is my shepherd. The Lord is in control. I honor Yahweh. You see, he responds in trust. Let's put God to the test. Give it 10 days and let's see what happens. And God supernaturally guided Daniel's life in this pressure situation. The providence of God is working in Daniel's life under pressure. And he's navigating Daniel and pushing him to be one of the greatest counselors that the world has ever seen. And look at the text, Daniel chapter 1 verse 17. Because Daniel took a stand, it says this. To these four young men, God gave For the third time in our text, God gave knowledge, understanding, and all kinds of literature and learning. And Daniel could understand visions and dreams of all kinds. And so Daniel gets an added gift here. And at the end of the time set by the king to bring them into his service, the chief official presented them to Nebuchadnezzar. The king talked with them, and then look, he found none equal to Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. And so they entered the king's service. And every matter of wisdom and understanding about which the king questioned them, he found them ten times better than all the magicians and enchanters in his whole kingdom. And Daniel remained there until the first year of King Cyrus. This is incredible. And this is a hyperbole, ten times better, right? Uh, it's an extreme exaggeration. Where do you think Daniel got all of this wisdom Where do you think Daniel got all of this might and this self-discipline? He got it from the Lord. He probably memorized the book of Proverbs. Can you imagine doing that? I mean, these guys had the first five books of the Old Testament probably memorized by the time that they were 12, 13, 14 years old. And all of this understanding and all of this reading came from God's word. One of the greatest things that you and I could ever do is to memorize scripture. And you will notice at your job, you will notice in your school, you will notice in your family, you will notice in every avenue of your life, you are wiser, you you are respected, you are looked to as somebody who actually knows what they're talking about. And that's why putting God's word in your mind and hiding it in your heart is one of the most important things that you could do. And so God is in complete control. He's guiding Daniel's life up to this point to where he has given him knowledge, instruction, wisdom, the special ability to interpret dreams and visions. And he presents him before the king according to verse 18. And the king sees it. The king sees how incredibly wise and smart Daniel is. And he found him ten times better, it says. Now Daniel was captured when he was about 17 to 20 years old. And if you could put a little marker in history, you would put that marker at 605 to 606 BC. This is when Daniel was captured. And at the age of 20, here he stands before some of the most incredibly powerful people in the entire world. And they look at this guy and they say, man, this guy is special. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, these guys are special. They know a little bit more than the average person. And they're recognized and they're glorified to where they are now in the service of the most powerful man on the face of this earth. You want to talk about God being in control. Try being the executive administrator to the president of the United States. Being on his chief council or a cabinet member, so to speak. I mean, we're talking about a very powerful position. And so Daniel proved this. And this is so very important. Daniel proved that success without compromising godliness was possible even in the midst of captivity. He made the best of his situation. And that's exactly what they were commanded to do. Guys, we find ourselves in a modern day Babylon. We find ourselves with kings and doctrines and principles and ideologies that are trying to convince you to compromise your faith, compromise who you are, just bend the knee just a little bit. Just identify yourself just a little bit different than what you read about in the Bible. And that's no big deal. Change your name. Change what you eat and what you drink. Change what you do and who you worship. Does it really matter in the end? And the answer is absolutely it matters. Daniel proved that it it is possible. Look at Jeremiah chapter 29 verses 4 through 9 up on the screen with me. This is the command that was given. Verse 4. 
This is what the Lord Almighty, the God of Israel, says to all of those I carried into exile from Jerusalem to Babylon. This is incredible. Build houses. Settle down. Plant gardens. Eat what they produce. Marry and have sons and daughters. Find wives for your sons and give your daughters in marriage so that they too may have sons and daughters. Increase in number there. Do not decrease. Also, seek what? Look at this. Peace. And prosperity of the city of which I had carried you into exile. Pray to the Lord for it. Because if it prospers, you too will prosper. Yes, this is what the Lord Almighty, the God of Israel says. Do not let the prophets and uh, the diviners among you deceive you. Do not listen to the dreams you, uh, that will encourage you to, to have them. They are prophesying lies to you in my name. I have not sent them, declares the Lord. You're going to be taken to Babylon. You're going to be captured. You're going to be overrun. But go and settle down. Go and have peace. Go and have prosperity. Go and and be at yourself. Be in your own life. But do not give an inch when it comes to false doctrine. Do not give an inch when it comes to false philosophies. Can't we take that and apply that to ourselves today? I mean, think about the situations that you're in at work. Think about the situations that you're in, even in this country, who, yes, uh, has always had a Christian, Judeo-Christian foundation, who, yes, we should fight tooth and nail to make America centered and focused around God. But yet we look around us and we see corruption. We see racism. We see bigotry. We see defilement. We see pornography and prostitution. We live, so to speak, in a very true modern-day Babylon. Go and have peace. Build your family. Marry and give in marriage. But when it comes to false doctrine and false ideologies, do not believe it. This is the message that we see from Daniel. And so if I could take away a few things uh, from the book of Daniel and learn from Daniel's story, the first thing that I would take away is this. Like Daniel, make the best of the predicament that you are in by being fully committed to godliness without compromise. You are here. You're alive in the United States of America, Severn, Maryland, Glen Birdie, Odeton, wherever you live. The job that you have is the job that you have. Make the best of that situation that you're in. We find in 1 Peter chapter 2, verses 13 through 17, this is exactly what Peter says. He says, submit yourself for the Lord's sake to every human authority, whether to the emperor as the supreme authority or to governors. When it comes to your local law enforcement, submit to them. When it comes to the laws of the land, submit to them. As long as they don't violate your conscience or violate your faith. Respect and honor people in positions of authority is what the Bible teaches. He says they are sent to punish those who do wrong and to commend those who do right. That's the purpose of government. Punish wrong, reward right. Sometimes we get those mixed up. Verse 15, Peter says this. Look at this. For it is God's will... That by doing good, you should silence the ignorant talk of foolish people. Live as free people. But do not use your freedom as a cover-up for evil. Live as God's slaves. Show proper respect to everyone. Love the family of believers. Fear God and honor the emperor. And so we have this command in the New Testament that we are in the situation that we are in. We live the lives that we live. And we should be respectful, honorable, people of integrity, people of stature, but never give an inch when it comes to the truthful teachings of Christianity. And if I could point to a second point, that would be it. Like Daniel, we should take the pressure of hardship as an opportunity to take a stand on what is true. Stand up for truth. When I was 18 years old, I was a senior in high school, I'd bring my Bible to school and I would read it. I didn't care what other people had to say. I'd read it in chemistry class once we were all done. And I can specifically remember people, you know, asking me about it. They they didn't really make fun of me about it uh, just because I was a lot bigger and stronger than I am now. But but I didn't care what they had to say. I would stand up for God in in my classes. I had uh, one teacher just really run down the God of Israel and how he was just a horrible war God. And anytime you read in the Old Testament, he's just a bloodthirsty God. And I took a stand. I didn't care what they had to say. I didn't care what the consequences were when it came to standing up for God. And we need to do that very same thing every single day of our life. We may be encouraged to bow the knee in complacency and apathy. It's not that big of a deal. Or you don't really have time to take a stand. And it may come at a great cost. 
If we face anything that causes us to become defiled, we must stand up to it. And that could be laws of the land. I am still against Roe v. versus Wade today, just like I was many years ago. And I will always be against that law because it is not what God wants for the life of the unborn. I will stand up for truthful biblical marriage, and I won't back down from that. I will always try to take a stand to the best of my ability with tact and insight about the truth and the integrity of the Christian gospel. And we should do the same thing. But that doesn't mean that I have to be vile and nasty and disrespectful and lose the witness of Christ for the sake of being right. Does that make sense? We find the Bible that says in Ephesians chapter 6, verses 4, Stand firm then. With the belt of truth buckled around your waist. Stand firm with the truth. The same thing in 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 13. Be on guard. Stand firm in the faith. Be courageous. Be strong. And so we have these ideologies of materialism. Live for yourself. Don't worry about other people around you. Collect everything that you possibly can. Get a bigger house. Get nicer cars. Buy two if you can. (laughs) Buy two retirement homes. Collect because at the end of the day, no one is going to take care of you like you. In our materialistic culture, we've got to fight against that. We've got to reject it. We have to be compassionate, kind, gracious, giving, charitable. We have to reject philosophical naturalism. This is taught in our schools. You just came from mere physical matter. And rather than turning to the ultimate cause, being God, look, it is so stupid to think that something can come from nothing. Do you realize how ridiculous that is? But your kids will go to class, they'll go to school, and they'll say material, burst of material, and we got material. I mean, that is just incredibly insane, right? Doesn't that seem insane to you, that something could come from nothing? We have to stand up against this type of false doctrine and false philosophy. God is the creator and the sustainer of the universe. And although we might not know exactly the method by which he took to do that, God is still the ultimate cause. And that is defended by scientists, theologians, philosophers that study and teach at some of the most prestigious universities in the entire world. But we have to take a stand up for truth. We have to stand up for Christian ethics for social pressure at work, influence with our friends. We've got to stand up against sexual expression, right? Sexual expression, be who you are. doesn't matter what you look like or what you wear. You don't have to be modest. Other people might have the issue, and they will indoctrinate our children, even from a very early young age, about things that God is just strictly against. And we have to teach our children and our kids about the integrity and the honor and the respect that our bodies have. We are a sacred temple of God. And one day I'm going to have to tell Piper, Piper, this is not worth your soul. Piper, who is my daughter, this is not worth your relationship with God. Piper, honor the Lord with your body. I'm going to have to teach her that one day. And Lord willing, we will be successful. We have to take a stand. And then finally, I would say this, like Daniel... We should take the pressure of hardship, the pressure that God gives us as discipline from the Lord. And this is the hardest one for me to stomach, to be honest with you. Because I look at somebody like Daniel, who was an incredibly holy man, who took a stand up for truth, who did the right thing, who honored God, and yet God let him go through one of the most horrific experiences of his life. I would highly doubt that his parents survived the war. I would highly doubt that if he had sisters that they lived a very good life. In fact, they were probably taken as slaves, uh, either a sex slave or a slave in a man's house. And I can't imagine the amount of hurt and heartache and pain that I would experience if my family was taken from me. And here I am looking up at God and saying, God, why would you let me go through this? Why would you let me experience this? I mean, I'm doing all the right things, and yet you let me go through this. It's supposed to be if I am wealthy and healthy spiritually, I am wealthy and healthy physically. And God doesn't let good people go through bad things. But that simply isn't the case. And sometimes we have to take the bad things that come in our life as potential discipline from the Lord. Let me share with you what I mean by that. You see, God punished Israel with evil nations. God surrounded them with evil nations, even though a lot of people were doing the right thing. And he may do that to you and I for the purpose of sharing in his holiness. God may discipline you. God may let you go through stuff in order to refine you. But we can't be confused. Sometimes God just 
lets us go through bad things because we're living in a bad place. And it's not something bad that you've done. It's not a lesson that God's trying to teach you or cause you to learn. But it's just simply we live in a fallen world. And bad things do happen. And so we get the task of figuring that out. And that's where we need wisdom. That's where we need counsel and guidance. God, why are you letting us go through this? It's important to understand that God even may discipline a community of people. He may discipline this church. Maybe he's disciplined this church in the past. And maybe you have done nothing wrong, but you feel the effect of that discipline and the hurt of that discipline. How should we respond? Hebrews chapter 12, verses 7 and 10 says this. Endure hardship as discipline. God is treating you as his children. For what children are not disciplined by their father? What kind of father doesn't discipline his own children, in other words? Verse 10, they disciplined us for a little while as they thought best, but God disciplines us for our good in order that we may share in his holiness. That's the whole point.